everyone, I'm Agent Lee from The Book Agent and I'm reading to you today Karen Slaughter with Blindsighted. I have already taught you about how amazing it is but this time I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to show it to you and I'm going to read it to you. So I'll start at the beginning and I have a little bit of a sore throat. This is why I got this little, this little one to help me. So I hope you're not too annoyed by it. Sarah Linton leans back in her chair, mumbling a soft, yes mama, on the phone. She wondered briefly if there would ever come a point in time where she would be too old to be taken over her mum's knee. Yes mama, she repeated, tapping her pen on the desk. She felt heat coming off her cheeks and an overwhelming sense of embarrassment took hold. A soft knock came at the office door, followed by a tentative Dr. Linton. Sarah suppressed her relief. I need to go, she said to her mother, who shut off one last astonishment before hanging up the phone. Nellie Morgan slid open the door, giving Sarah a hard look. As office manager for the Hartsdale Children's Clinic, Nellie was the closest thing Sarah had to secretary. Nellie had been running the place for as long as Sarah could remember, even as far back as when Sarah was herself a patient here. Nellie said, your cheeks are on fire. I just got yelled at by my mother. Nellie raised an eyebrow, I assume with good reasons. Well, Sarah said, hoping that would end it. The labs on Jimmy Powell came in, Nellie said still eyeing Sarah. And the mail, she added, dropping a stack of letters on top of the in basket. The plastic bowl under the added weight. Oh, the plastic bowl under the added weight. Sorry. Sarah sighed as she read over the facts. On a good day, she diagnosed earaches and sore throats. Today, she would have to tell the parents of a 12-year-old boy that he had acute Myeloblastic leukemia. Not good, Nellie guessed. She had worked at the cleaning long enough to know how to read a lab report. No, Sarah agreed, rubbing her eyes. Not good at all. She sat back in her chair, asking, The Powells are at Disney World, right? For his birthday, Nellie said. They should be back tonight. Sarah felt a sadness come over her. She had never gotten used to delivering this kind of news. Nellie offered, I can schedule them for first thing in the morning. Thanks, Sarah answered, tucking the report into Jimmy Powell's chart. She glanced at the clock on the wall as she did this and let out an audible gasp. Is that right? she asked, checking the time again, again on her watch. I was supposed to meet Tessa at lunch 15 minutes ago. Nellie checked her own watch. This late in the day? It's close to supper time. It was only it was the only time I could make it, Sarah said. Gathering charts together. She bumped the inbox and papers fell onto the floor in a heap, cracking the plastic tray. Crap, Sarah hissed. Nellie started to help, but Sarah stopped her. Aside from the fact that Sarah did not like other people cleaning up her mess. If Nellie somehow managed to get down on her knees, it was doubtful she would be able to get back up without considerable assistance. I've got it, Sarah told her, scooping up the whole pile and dropping it on her desk. Was there anything else? Nellie flashed a smile. Chief Tolliver's holding on line three. Sarah sat back on her heels, a feeling of dread washing over her. She did double duty as the town's pediatrician and coroner. Geoffrey Tolliver, her ex-husband, was the chief of police. There were only two reasons for him to be calling Sarah in the middle of the day, neither of them particularly pleasant. Sarah stood and picked up the phone, giving him the benefit of the doubt. Somebody better be dead. Jeffrey's voice was garbled, and she assumed he was using his cellular phone. Sorry to disappoint her, he said, 
<clears throat> then, I've been on hold for 10 minutes. What if this had been an emergency? Sarah started shoving papers into her briefcase. It was an unwritten clinic policy to make Jeffrey jump through hoops of fire before he could speak to Sarah on the phone. She was actually surprised that Nellie remembered to tell Sarah he was on the phone. Sarah? She glanced at the door, mumbling. I knew I should have just left. What? He asked, his voice echoing slightly on the cellular. I said you always send someone if it's an emergency, she lied. Where are you? At the college, he answered. I'm waiting for the deputy dogs. He was using that term for the campus security at Grant Tech, the state university at the centre of town. She asked, what is it? I just wanted to see how you were doing. Fine, she snapped, pulling the papers back out of a briefcase, wondering why she put them there in the first place. She flipped through some charts, shoving them into the side pockets. She said, I'm late for lunch or Tess. What did you need? He seemed taken aback by her curt tone. You just looked distracted yesterday, he said, in church. I wasn't distracted, she mumbled, flipping through the mail. She stopped at the side of a postcard, her whole body rigid, going rigid. The front of the card showed a picture of Emory University in Atlanta, Sarah's alma mater. Neatly typed on the back beside her address at the children's clinic were the words why hast thou forsaken me? Sarah? A cold sweat came over her. I need to go. Sarah, I... She hung up the phone before Jeffrey could finish his sentence. Shoving three most more charts into her briefcase along with the postcard. She slipped out the side door without anyone seeing her. Sunlight beams down on Sarah as she walked into the street. There was a chill in the air that had not been there this morning, and the dark clouds promised rain later on tonight. A red thunderbird, thunderbird passed, a small arm hanging out the window. Hey, Dr. Linton, a child called. Sarah waved, calling, hey. Back as she crossed the street, Sarah switched the briefcase from one to the other as she cut across the lawn in front of the college. She took a right onto the sidewalk, heading toward Main Street, and was at the dining room in less than five minutes. Tessa was sitting in a booth on the far wall of the empty diner, eating a hamburger. She did not look pleased. Sorry, I'm late, Sarah offered, walking toward her sister. She tried to smile, but Tessa did not respond in kind. You said two. It's nearly 2.30. I had paperwork, Sarah explained, tucking her briefcase into the booth. Tessa was a plumber, like their father. While clock drains were no laughing matter, very seldom did Linton and daughters get the kind of emergency phone calls that Sarah did on a daily basis. Her family could not grasp what a busy day was like for Sarah and were constantly irritated by her lateness. I called the morgue too, Tess informed her, nibbling a french fry. You weren't there. Sarah sat down with a groan, running her fingers through her hair. I dropped back by the clinic and Mama called and the time got away from me. She stopped, saying what she always did. I'm sorry, I should have called. When Tessa did not respond, Sarah continued. You can keep being mad at me for the rest of the lunch or you can drop it and I'll buy you a slice of chocolate cream pie. Red velvet, Tessa counted. Deal. Sarah returns, feeling an inordinate sense of relief. It was bad enough having a mother mad at her. Speaking of calls, Tessa began, and Sarah knew where she was going, even before she asked the question. Hear from Jeffrey? Sarah raised up, tucking her hand into her front pocket. She pulled out two five-dollar bills. He called before I left the clinic. Tessa barked a laugh that filled the restaurant. What did he say? I cut him off before I could say anything. Sarah answered, handing his sister the money. Tessa tucked the fives into, into the back pocket of her blue jeans. So, Mama called? She was pretty pissed at you. I'm pretty pissed at me too, Sarah said. 
After being divorced for two years, she still could not let go of her ex-husband. Sarah vacillated between hating Jeffrey Tolliver and hating herself because of this. She wanted just one day to go by without thinking about him, without having him in her life. Yesterday, much like today, had not been that day. Easter Sunday was important to her mother. While Sarah was not particularly religious, putting on pantyhose on Sunday of the year was a small price to pay for Kathy Linton's happiness. Sarah had not planned on Geoffrey being at church. She had caught him out of the corner of her eye just after the first hymn. He was sitting three rows behind and to the right of her, and they seemed to notice each other at the same time. Sarah had forced herself to look away first. Sitting there in church, staring at the preacher without hearing a word the man was saying, Sarah had felt Geoffrey's gaze on the back of her neck, there was a heat from the intensity of his stare that caused a warm flush to come over her. Despite the fact that she was sitting in church with her mother on one side of her and Tessa and her father on the other, Sarah had felt her body responding to the look Geoffrey had given her. There was something about the time of the year that turned her into a completely different person. She was actually fidgeting in her seat, thinking about Geoffrey touching her. The way his hands felt on her skin when Kathleen Tin jabbed her elbow into Sarah's ribs. Her mother's expression said she knew exactly what was going through Sarah's mind at that moment and did not like it one bit. Kathy had crossed her arms angrily, her posture indicating she was resigning herself to the fact that Sarah would go to hell for thinking about sex at the Primitive Baptist on Easter Sunday. There was a prayer, then another hymn. After what seemed like an appropriate amount of time, Sarah glanced over her shoulder to find Jeffrey again, only to see him with his head bent down to his chest as he slept. This was the problem with Jeffrey Toiva. The idea of him was much better than the reality. Tessa tapped her finger on the table for Sarah's attention. Sarah? Sarah put her hand to her chest, conscious that her heart was pounding the same way it had yesterday morning in church. What? Tessa gave her a knowing look, but thankfully did not pursue it. What did Jeb say? What do you mean? I saw you talking to him after the service, Tessa said. What did he say? Sarah debated whether or not to lie. Finally, she answered. He asked me out for lunch today, but I told him I was seeing you. You could have cancelled. Sarah shrugged. We're going out Wednesday night. Tessa did everything but clapped her hands together. God, Sarah groaned. What was I thinking? Not about Jeffrey for a chance. Right. Sarah took the menu from behind the napkin holder. Tough, she hardly needed to look at it. She or some member of her family had eaten at the, at the Grand Filling Station at least once a week since Sarah was three years old, and the only change to the menu in all that time had been Pete Wayne, the owner, had added peanut brittle to the dessert menu in honour of the President Jimmy Carter. Tessa reached across the table, gently pushing down the menu. You okay? It's that time of the year again, Sarah said rummaging around in a briefcase. She found the postcard and held it up. Tessa did not take the card, so Sarah read aloud from the back. Why hast thou forsaken me? She put the card down on the table between them, waiting for Sarah's, Tessa's response. From the Bible? Tessa asked. Tough, surely, she knew. Sarah looked out the window, trying to compose herself. Suddenly, she stood up from the table saying, I need to go and wash my hands, Sarah. She waved off Tessa's concern, waking to the back of the diner, trying to hold herself together until she reached the bathroom. The door to the women's room had stuck in the frame since the beginning of time, so Sarah gave the handle a hard yank. Inside, the small black and white tilted bathroom was cool and almost comforting. She leaned back against the wall hands to her face, trying to wipe out the last few hours of the day. 
Jimmy Powell's lab results still haunted her. 12 years ago, while working a medical internship at Atlanta Grady Hospital, Sarah had grown familiar with, if not accustomed to, death. Grady had the best ER in the southeast, and Sarah had seen her share of difficult traumas. From a kid who had swallowed a pack of razor blades to a teenage girl who had been given a cloth hanger abortion. These were horrible cases, but not altogether unexpected in such a large city. Cases like Jimmy Powell's coming through the children's clinic hit Sarah with the force of a wrecking ball. This would be the one of the rare cases when Sarah's two jobs would converge. Jimmy Powell, who liked to watch college basketball and held one of the largest collections of Hot Wheels Sarah had personally ever seen, would more than likely be dead within the next year. Sarah clipped her hair back into a loose ponytail as she waited for the sink to fill with cold water. She leaned over the sink, pausing at the sickly sweet smell coming from the basin. Peter probably dumped vinegar down the drain to keep it from smelling sour. It was an old plumber's trick, but Sarah hated the smell of vinegar. She held her breath as she leaned back over, splashing her face with water, trying to wake up. A glance back at the mirror showed nothing had improved, but a wet spot from the water just below the neckline of her shirt. Great, she mumbled. She dried her hands on her pants as she walked towards the stalls. After seeing the contents of the toilet, she moved to the next stall, the handicap stall, and opened the door. Oh, Sarah breathed. Stepping back quickly, only stopping when the sink basin pressed against the back of her legs. She put her hands behind her, bracing herself on the counter. A metallic taste came to her mouth, and Sarah forced herself to take in gulps of air so that she wouldn't pass out. She dropped her head down, closing her eyes, counting out a full five seconds before she looked, before she looked back up again. Sybil Adams, a professor at the college, sat on a toilet. Her head was tilted back against the a baguette tilted wall, her eyes closed. Her pants were pulled down around the ankles, legs splayed wide open. She had been stabbed in the abdomen. Blood filled the toilet between her legs, dripping onto the tiled floor. Sarah forced herself to move into the stall, crouching in front of the young woman. Sarah's shirt was pulled up, and Sarah could see a large vertical cut down her abdomen, bisecting her navel and stopping at the pubic bone. Another cut, much deeper, slashed horizontally onto her breast. This was the source of most of the blood and it still dripped in a steady stream down the body. Sarah put her hand to the wound, trying to halt the bleeding, but blood seeped between her fingers, as if she were squeezing a sponge. If I got you interested, then read it for yourself. Blindsided, from Karen Slaughter, and it is from the Grand series. Hope you have pleasure with reading it.